Good evening and Merry Christmas. It's good to see all you guys. Hey, to all our guests, uh, welcome. Um, I know that a lot of you have your little squiggly worms with you. I got mine in here. So I just wanted to bring her up here just to encourage you guys. I totally understand with the wiggly worms and the loud shouts and the noises and all that sort of stuff. We're family here at River Run. We're glad that you guys are here and we're here with your kids. We think it's important to worship with your kids. But if they get a little crazy, a little nuts, um, you'll, you might be over there meeting my wife, Kimberly, with little Mabel over here. We got a room back over there as well. We'll pipe in the message and everything um, for you as well. But more than anything, we want you to enjoy your evening with your kids. All right, here, honey, why don't you come and take Mabel f from me? All right. I feel like Michael Jackson passing her over the, uh, the flames right there. <laughs> All right. Let's pray, because I just totally lost what I was thinking after that one. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for gathering us here this evening, Lord. We love you, and we are so incredibly grateful for you and your grace in our lives. We're so thankful that you came into this world to walk amongst us and to save us. We love you, and we're so grateful. And so, Father, just bless our evening that we have together. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Hey, before I get into my, my, my message, I got to tell you how excited I am about this new year. Because let me just ask you a question. Have you grown since last year, January 1st, till today, have you grown in such a way that you can clearly communicate exactly how and where you have grown in your life? That's a really hard thing to do, right? I mean, we got a lot of responsibilities. We got a lot of things we got to do. There's a lot of distractions um, in life. And that's why I'm so excited about the new year because as Justin was saying earlier, man, we got some really, really great things coming on online that uh, we believe that if you come along with us in 2017, that by the end of the year, you will clearly see how you've changed. And you will be able to clearly articulate exactly how you've changed in your life. In fact, one of those opportunities that we have for you, uh, beginning of the new year on January 8th, is a new sermon series that we're going to do. It's called Go Boldly. This whole series can be illustrated with the famous uh, speech that JFK gave about um, putting man on the moon. Why don't you watch this? So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We shall send to the moon, 240,000 miles away, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Man, that'll get you fired up. But that's not what I'm excited about. I'm excited because I know that some of you are going to choose God for the first time. That you're going to choose to follow God like you've never done before. And your quest for truth is going to lead to learning about who you are, about God, about life in such a way that it will change your life. It will it, be like getting on top of a 360-foot Saturn V rocket with, with a million gallons of fuel and say, all right, God, 
light it up. Let's see what you got. And you're going to go on an amazing journey. A journey that where you're going to tell stories for all eternity. That's what I am so excited about in this new year. I'm so excited about that we're going to start this journey today. Because you see, way, 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 long, 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 long time before JFK prophetically spoke that we will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Way, way, way long time ago, in the hills of the Middle East, there was an ancient prophet by the name of Yeshaya ben Amutz, who predicted and proclaimed something even more magnificent than a man walking on the moon. He predicted that God would become man and he would walk on earth. Around 125 BC, that's before Christ, guys, right? 125 years before Jesus was born, in the Israeli region of the Dead Sea, there was this scribe, and he was opening up his, his new scroll and took out his writing pen, his writing tool, and began to pour off ink and copy the words of this prophet. I want you to look at this picture right here. That is a scroll dating to 125 B.C. that has the prophetic words of this Yeshaya ben Amutz. And as he's writing this down, I want you to just kind of, now that you've seen, I want you to close your eyes. Just humor me here. Close your eyes and just imagine this ancient scribe in the desert of Israel. And he's slowly writing down these Hebrew words. And he writes down the words, Emmanuel. Now you may not know what in the world that was it, but if you look at the next screen, that's exactly what I just read to you in Hebrew right there. 125 years before Jesus was born. If I translate this into our modern English here for us tonight, it would say something like this. Behold, I give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. And he will be called Emmanuel. This Yeshaya ben Amutz, if we anglicize it, his name is Isaiah, son of Amaz. And he spoke these words by which 125 years later, after this scribe wrote down these words, they came true. God entered humanity and he became man, became one of us. And I could spend a lot of time just talking about how amazing that event was, how unique it was in human history, the pure brilliance and the humility and, and just amazement of the birth of God through these two young couples in this town that none of us would probably even know existed if it wasn't for this guy. But that would miss the most important part of the mission. You see... Just to celebrate Jesus' birth would be like to celebrate man landing on the moon, but they never came back. The glory of the mission of going to Mars was, was realized when these guys came back. The birth of Christ is just the beginning. You see the word or the name of Jesus, which in the first century you would have heard more, the, heard it said this way, Yeshua means to save. The fact that his name means to save means that you and I, we need to be saved. It's the whole reason and being for coming into this world to save us, to save mankind. And it's nothing that we can do. It's not anything that we can do by pull up our own bootstraps to live a perfect life, a perfect love and perfect goodness. We just can't do it. We need a savior. If we could do it ourselves, isn't it, wouldn't it be just true that Jesus would just write a great selling self-help book and just say, figure it out. Do it on yourself. Do it on your own. And not die the way that he died? No, because there's something more that's needed. 
There's something more than just being nicer than being naughty. If that was the case, then God would have just sent us a big scale by which then we can just kind of get on and go, oh, I guess I'm a little bit more naughty than nice, so I better, I better start being good. Or we step on the scale and go, whoa, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty nice. So that means I get to fudge a little bit. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I love the way that this guy, Vaclav Havel, put it. Vaclav Havel was the first president of the Czech Republic. And he is one of only four non-Americans that have their bust displayed in our U.S. Capitol. And a guy who, who had the opportunity to have a front row seat in the Czech Republic to see the communism in the West and capitalism in the, I mean, communism in the, in the, uh, the East and, and capitalism in the West, he said this. I think he was spot on. He said, humanity cannot save itself. Humanity cannot save itself. The belief that we can save ourselves or that some political system or human ideology can fix human problems has only led to more darkness. And if that was the case, then God would have just become man and he would have kicked some Roman can and he would have set himself up as a king. But there's something that God knows about us that sometimes we neglect to understand. But if we kind of look inwardly a little bit more, we, we see it. That our problem is not without there. Our problem isn't our circumstances. Our problem isn't out there. The problem with humanity is fundamentally in here. And so, the message of the birth of Christ, it, it is not good advice. The birth of Christ is not good advice. It is good news that a Savior has come into the world to do what you and I could never do, save ourselves. We cannot get to heaven, and so God came to us to get us. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, the way that God saved us wasn't through the birth of Jesus it was through his sacrifice of his life, a perfect man for our death penalty. You see, the birth of Christ was one small step for man. The death and resurrection of Christ is one giant leap for mankind. Because it's at that moment that God offered through his death and resurrection eternal life. The most beautiful gift that has ever been given. A gift of pure joy, a gift of pure love. But it is a gift, and all gifts must be received. It's not shoved on you, because that wouldn't be love. But if we don't receive this gift, then we're on our own. And we, at the end of our lives, we will stand before God, and, and we will be judged by our life work. Not compared to other people, not compared to some slide rule, but compared to the righteous and perfection of God. Not because God is mean. It's because God is just. But the beautiful thing is, our God is love. And in his love, he came into this world to give his life, to raise from the dead, so that you and I can have a gift. A gift that is for you. A gift that is eternal a gift that will never be taken away from you. If you take it, it is a beautiful gift that he gives you. So let me just ask a fundamental question on this most important evening of Christmas Eve as we reflect tonight and in tomorrow the birth of Christ. Let me ask you a question. Maybe you've heard this question before. But if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Because here's the deal. There's no doubt I'm sure that Jesus is thankful for our celebration. There's no doubt I'm sure he's thankful for the gifts that we give to him. But that's not what Jesus wants. Do you know what Jesus wants? He wants you. He wants us. He wants us to be with him for all eternity. And if you receive this gift that he offers to you free of charge to you because he paid it himself, then you will find I guarantee you, you will find that the best gift 
ever is not eternal life. The best gift ever is God himself, who you get to enjoy for eternity. That's what Christmas is all about. Let's pray. Father, I just want to talk to you for a second about those in this room here that choose to come to you for the first time. They're choosing it. That your spirit and that you, you're moving them. God, maybe they haven't received this gift and maybe they've gone to Christmas services over and over and over and maybe they've heard the same message a gazillion times. But God, I pray that they would just get over the message and take hold of the beautiful gift that you, you are giving them right now. And for those of, in this room who just recognize that they're in perfection and being separated from a, an amazing, beautiful, perfect God, that I pray that right now that they would receive that gift of eternal life. And as they receive that gift, I pray that your spirit would encourage them to let them know that they are yours from this day forward forever, that this Christmas Eve, they will look back forever as the day that they received the gift and they became yours for all eternity, God. And Father, I pray for the rest of us who have already received that gift. Thank you. Thank you. We bask in the, the wonderful and beauty of knowing that we are sure that we are with you forever. And that's a beautiful, amazing gift. Thank you for that peace that even if, if our life here on earth were done, we would be with you forever. And that's a glorious thing. It gives us peace. It gives us security. It gives us joy. But also, Father, I pray for those who have received this gift that this day too would be a day where we would all say, I choose. I choose to follow you like nobody's business, God. God, I'm scared, but I want to get on top of that rocket and see where you take me and take hold of the greatest adventure that they'll ever go on, God. It's in your son's name I pray.